I want to talk to you today about analyticity. In other words, the analytic-synthetic distinction. It's one of the basic distinctions of philosophy. It's primarily a semantic distinction. And I want to look at a little bit of its history, but focus on how it's understood today. So first of all, there is something like this in Aquinas when he talks about things that are true because the predicate is contained in the subject. What he really means is that there is one concept that is contained in another concept. Leibniz later developed an entire calculus of concepts where he talks about containment as the basic relationship among concepts. This notion gets developed and really recognized independently for the first time by John Locke, who refers to certain propositions as trifling propositions. Propositions that tell us nothing about the world, but may express something about logic or about the nature of language. So, for example, if I say a soul is a soul, that isn't a very helpful answer to the question, what is a soul? But it is true, a soul is a soul. Um, lead is lead, water is water, and so forth. Those things are logical truths, and some of these are truths by definitions. He thought that lead is a metal is a good example of this, or that gold is yellow. Those aren't great examples in my view, but there are other kinds of examples, things that would be true by definition, like bachelors are unmarried, for example. If we reflect on logical truths and truths by definition, we can ask what they have in common. And the answer seems to be this. Their truth value is determined by the meanings of the terms inside them. A soul is a soul, or bachelors are unmarried. True, if you just understand the basic terms like is or bachelor. That's all you need. Everything else follows from language. So we might describe these as purely verbal truths. Truths that don't tell us anything about the world. And I'll come back to the difference between those two ways of understanding analyticity in a moment. The terms analytic and synthetic were first introduced by Immanuel Kant. Kant says that an analytic judgment is one where, hearkening back to Aquinas, the predicate is contained in the subject. The concept of the predicate, that is, is contained in the concept of the subject. We could understand it that way, but almost immediately people generalize that to thinking in broader terms. It's a matter of having your truth value determined by the meanings of the terms. So we can say that a judgment is analytic if and only if the meanings of the terms within it determine whether it's true or false. A synthetic proposition is simply one that is not analytic. So it's synthetic if the meanings of the terms do not determine its truth value. To do that, we would have to presumably look at the world. The classic attack on the analytic-synthetic distinction was given in an essay Two Dogmas of Empiricism by Willard Van Orman Quine. Quine's argument is complicated, and I think there are many different interpretations of exactly what he's doing in that essay. Here I'll just say that he thinks that an empiricist really has no right to that distinction. Now why not? Well, essentially he says, to understand analyticity you have to understand meaning. It's a matter of having your truth value determined by the meanings of the terms. But how can you understand meaning? He thinks that meaning is not something that we can really have access to in experience. And so he doesn't see how an empiricist can really draw this distinction, given that they really don't have a grasp of meaning. Now, he said that problem would be solved if the empiricist had a grasp of necessity. Then we could say there's a kind of verbal necessity to these truths, like a soul is a soul or bachelors are unmarried. But he ends up saying, there is no way to grasp necessity. Hume taught the empiricist that, he thinks. And so in the end, he thinks that analyticity, meaning, necessity, synonymy, that is to say, things having the same meaning, and a variety of other concepts are all tied up together, and they're all problematic for an empiricist. That's not gonna stop the rationalist from drawing the distinction, but it will stop, he thinks, an empiricist. And so he argues for a version of empiricism that does not rest on the analytic-synthetic distinction, doesn't take some of the truths, the analytic ones, and put them aside and say, I'm really talking about the others, as depending on experience. For Quine, everything has to depend on experience. Another way in which he seems to object is that there are certain propositions that it's very hard to classify. His example in the essay is everything green is extended. That is to say, extended in space and time, has some spatial extension, some width, some breadth. Um, is that 
true by definitions of the terms? He says, I'm not sure. There was a similar debate going on at the time among various philosophers who were contemplating propositions like this. Nothing could be both red and green all over. Not, I'm not talking about a red and green plaid or something like that. I mean red all over and green all over. Well, that seems true. Nothing could be both red all over and green all over. But what kind of truth is that? Is that something we learn from experience? Is that something that's true by virtue of the meanings of the terms? When we reflect on it, we realize we can't intuit it. We can't grasp or imagine or even conceive of, maybe, a situation where something is both red all over and green all over. But are we willing to say, gosh, that's true by virtue of the meanings of the terms. We'd have to understand the meanings of terms like red and green. And it's not clear that we understand them in a way that would make them incompatible. Another objection that Quine seems to raise in the essay is how do we end up drawing the distinction? We can sometimes give a semantic theory, that is to say a theory of meaning, but that is itself an empirical theory. That is to say it rests on experience. Well, if that's true, then you might say the very basis for declaring certain things to be truths of semantics, truths by virtue of meaning, to take certain things as semantical rules, is itself part of a theory that rests on experience. That would be a way of focusing on what I call a boundary question. Not saying something like, is everything green is extended, analytic, but suppose we have a proposition about analyticity, something like bachelors are unmarried is an analytic truth. Is that itself analytic or synthetic? That is to say, when we describe something as analytic or as synthetic, is that itself an analytic statement? Or is that a synthetic statement? It's not that easy to say. Traditionally, I think people thought of it as an analytic statement. After all, you understand the meaning of the term analytic. Its truth value is determined by the meanings of its terms. And then you understand, for example, bachelor and unmarried and are. And you put those together and you say, yes, it is true that, in fact, it's true by virtue of meanings. Not only that bachelors are unmarried, but that it's analytic that bachelors are unmarried. But Quine is saying, wait a minute, that depends on a theory of meaning, and a theory of meaning is an empirical linguistic theory. So actually, we have to understand such classifications, separating the analytic from the synthetic, as themselves synthetic. In other words, one way of looking at his attack is to say it is a synthetic truth that bachelors are unmarried is analytic. And if we think of it that way, we realize, hold on a second, this whole thing is part of an empirical theory of the world. So actually, we can't separately from that take some sentences and put them aside and say they're just true by virtue of meanings or false by virtue of meanings. Whatever we end up thinking about that issue. There's another way of thinking about analytic statements. I've described them as things that are verbal truths, but also as things that don't tell us anything about the world. Locke thinks of analytic truths as trifling propositions. That is to say, they give us no information about the world. They convey no information at all, except maybe about language, like telling us what the word bachelor means. And so they tell us nothing about the world as such. Well, suppose we thought of an analytic statement as being defined that way, not having its truth value determined by the meanings of its terms, but instead as something that conveys no information about the world, that you might say no empirical evidence could be relevant to. It could not be confirmed or disconfirmed by anything about the world. So you might say it's isolated from anything empirical. So let's call an analytic statement understood in that sense empirically isolated. If we understood things that way, then we could say a synthetic statement is one that's not empirically isolated. In other words, it does give us information about the world. So we could say, look, a, a synthetic statement, if I learn that, I learn something about the world. But if I learn an analytic statement, I learn nothing about the world. All I'm learning is at best something about language. If I think of things that way, then I really start from a conception of what's empirical, what is about the world in some sense, what evidence could confirm or disconfirm. And those are not exactly the same thing. If I'm thinking about what conveys information about the world, well, is that the same thing as what could be confirmed or disconfirmed? Maybe, but maybe there's some things about the world 
that I couldn't confirm, I couldn't disconfirm. They are, let's say, facts about things outside my light cone. I couldn't possibly get any information about them. There could also be the classic empiricist cases of meaningless propositions that I ought to commit to the flames, to use Hume's phrase. So if all that is right, there are actually two ways of understanding this idea of empirically isolated. One would be to say that an analytic statement is empirically isolated in the sense that it conveys no information about the world at all. Another would be to say that it's something that experience could neither confirm nor disconfirm. It would be a matter of, well, language perhaps, or logic, or something other than experience that would give us information about it. So there are really two ways of understanding this. The semantic one that says that an analytic statement conveys no information about the world, at best about the uses of language. Whereas a synthetic statement conveys real information about the world beyond something about language. But even that's tricky. Because after all, if I describe the languages of the indigenous peoples of South America, for example, I'm doing it on the basis of empirical research. I'm telling you things about language. But on the other hand, that's not analytic. <laughs> there is no analytic truth that tells me how many languages there are spoken in South America, for example. And so even then, it seems like we're presupposing some notion of meaning to describe what constitutes information about the world or what constitutes information about language. Another way of looking at it is to say that empirical information could not give us any confirmation or disconfirmation. But then we're in danger of grouping analytic statements with those that are just meaningless. If I say something that is pure nonsense, well, that's not going to convey any information about the world, and no empirical evidence will confirm or disconfirm it either. But it's not because it's analytically true or analytically false. It's just conveying no information about the world because it conveys no information at all. So it is not very easy to mark out in this way exactly what analytic judgments are. But let's take a step back. As this distinction has been classically understood, an analytic statement is true by virtue of the meanings of its terms. And often we do have a, an intuitive grasp of meaning that tells us, yes, bachelors are unmarried. That is something that is true by definition. It's true by virtue of the meanings of the terms bachelor and unmarried. We don't have to do empirical research. We can't apply for a grant to study the question of whether bachelors are unmarried. That's obviously foolish. There is nothing to investigate. It's determined to be true by the meanings of the terms. There might be borderline cases, cases where we have a hard time settling it, like nothing can be both red all over and green all over, or everything green is extended. Color terms are notoriously problematic, and we might decide, yes, in some of those cases, we really don't have a very good theory of meaning of the term that enables us to decide such questions. So in practice, I think most philosophers have said, well, even if Quine is right that there are some borderline cases, and even if it's true that in the end, drawing the distinction is part of an empirical theory of language and meaning, and so part of the science of semantics, so it's part of the science of semantics. That is to say, it's partly the job of linguistics and to some extent the job of philosophers and logicians to figure out what the meanings of our terms are, how to construct a theory of it, and thereby what ends up counting it as an analytic truth. So it may be that calling something analytic or calling something synthetic is itself a synthetic judgment, but that doesn't make it meaningless and it doesn't make us reject the distinction.